that wasn't disturbing at all then, was it? Wow. <laughs> well, glad you guys are here. Thanks for joining in with us. And uh, let me just start uh, with an illustration. You know, I bet you've all been in a certain social situation. I think we've all can kind of been in this kind of situation. I'll, I'll describe it to you. You're maybe at a party or you're getting to know somebody. You don't know them very well, and you're just sort of starting out with small talk. And small talk always winds up pretty much the same thing. You ask some pretty basic questions, and, and it almost always goes back to, well, what do you do? Well, what's your job? What do you do for a living? And, and then you tell somebody what you do for a living, and, and, you know, there are some careers that when you tell them to people, they go, wow, that must be a cool job. I wonder what it's like to have a job like that. Or, or maybe even they say, when I was a kid, I always wondered what it would be like to have that job, or I wanted to be that when I grew up. Can I just let you in on a secret? I've been preaching now for like two decades, and I've had lots of small talk conversations. I have never once had a person say that to me, ever. And, and, it, and, it, and it's just funny to me because there are all kinds of careers that people look up to and admire, you know, policemen, firemen, doctors, pilots, even, even lawyers. There are people out there who will say about those professions, man, I think that's cool. I'd love to give that a try. Nobody ever says that about mine. In fact, when I tell people that I'm a preacher, I, I usually get the same reaction. Uh, usually they'll get this real sympathetic look on their face and they'll sometimes even almost like pat me on the arm and go, oh, that is just so good. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the uh, the reaction you get from your grandma when you tell her anything, and she just goes, "Oh, honey, that's just so nice." I mean, that's that's what happens to me, and I, and I know what people are thinking in the back of their minds. Whenever whenever they find out what I do, they're thinking in the back of their minds, "You poor pitiful man, you you are probably so uh, so sexually and morally repressed. You are just about to explode right here in front of me. I'm just I feel so sorry for you." That's that's what people think. But I will say this. I have discovered that there is one moment in people's lives. There's one situation that people tend to find themselves in where everybody wants to be a preacher. And, and I'll tell you what it is. It's whenever somebody you love or maybe that kid that you raised or somebody who works for you, somebody that you expected was going to do a certain thing or live a certain way, and that person just did not live up to your expectations. They, they didn't act the way you wanted them to act. They didn't prove to be trustworthy. Th they made a decision, and, and you just could not, and you can never agree with the decision they made. And in that moment, everybody wishes they were a preacher. Because here's what you want to do. Whenever somebody doesn't meet your expectations, when they disappoint you, when they hurt you, you want to point your finger at them. You want to get the podium, you want the microphone, you want to get the big book with all the answers in it, and you want to break that out, and you want to point to them, and you want to say, here's what you did wrong, and I can prove it. L let me just tell you how you have messed up your life. Can I, can I just share with you what a mess you've made of not only your life, but the way you've disappointed me? Can, can I just tell you what you should have done, what you could have done, and what you would have done if you'd have just listened to me when I was trying to tell you? Let me just tell you how things would have been so much better if you'd have done it my way. <laughs> and, and in this perfect scenario that we all play out in our minds, we say all of the stuff. We get done with convincing and convicting that person, and it always works out the same way in your head, right? That person falls to their knees, and they say, Oh, you are so right, and I was so wrong. Could you ever find it in your heart to forgive me? I, 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 I have totally messed up. You're right. And what do you do in that perfect scenario in your head? <laughs> well, most often we just sort of fold our arms and turn our back, and we say, well, I'll think about it. I'll think about it now that now I'll think about whether you've done enough or whether I can let you back into my world or into my good graces. Now, I know I made that sound a little bit extreme, but let's be honest, that happens all the time, right? Like maybe it's with a kid that you raised or maybe it was a person that you hired. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a close friend, or maybe it's even your spouse, and, and they just didn't do what you expected them to do. They didn't do what you trained them to do. They didn't do what you even paid them 
to do or raised them to do, and, 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 and it makes you mad. You, you, get, you get hurt. You, you get disappointed, and here's what we do. We methodically and, and, and sometimes even very delicately begin to sort of shut them out of our lives. We sort of move them to the side, and, and you stop calling them. You, you, you give them a little bit of the silent treatment when they're around. You certainly don't serve them. You, you don't go out of your way on their behalf until, of course, they decide to clean their act up. Well, then, then I'll start to think about whether or not I'm going to accept them back into my life again. And see, this way of reacting to people, this way of treating people, it, that's the people skill that we're going to be looking at today. And, and just to sort of recap what, what this whole series is about, if you haven't been with us, we're talking about rules for relationships, and we're talking about people skills. We're talking about these common ways that we tend to, to live or, or we tend to act towards the people in our lives. They're just ways that we just sort of operate. And, and, and maybe you realize that you live by these rules or these people skills, and maybe you, you don't even realize it. Most of them come from the way you were brought up. It comes from the family that you, you were in. It comes from, honestly, the way you've experienced, the way people have treated you throughout your life. Sometimes they come from your environment, just the culture around you. They're just these unconscious habits and these ways of doing relationships, and they just... They just come natural to us. And most of the time, I'll tell you, most of the time, this is how it goes. Most of the time, the way I treat people, my people skills consist of this. I'll treat you the way you have treated me. I'll do for you whatever you've done for me. I'll treat you the way my friends tell me I ought to treat you. I'll treat you the way the culture says that I ought to treat you. And that sounds fine, and that sounds good, at least until you become a follower of Jesus. And then things start to change. Because when you become a follower of Jesus, you start to build a relationship with God. And that relationship with God is built on a few things. And one of them is unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. It's a relationship characterized by grace and mercy and forgiveness. And more specifically, not treating you the way you deserve to be treated. Or what people think you deserve to be treated like. Or what the culture says you ought to be treated like. And the more your life begins to revolve around that relationship that God begins to build with you and me in our lives, the more you start to wonder, how in the world could God love me, trust me, forgive me, accept me the way that he does? And the more that kind of a relationship takes root in your heart and in your attitude and in your mind, then God comes to you and me as his followers and says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build relationships like I've built with you. I want you to do relationships. I want you to do people the way I've treated you. God says, I want you to love the way I love you. I want you to forgive the way I've forgiven you. I want you to accept the way I have accepted you. And that one right there, that last one, that's the people skill that I want us to sort of bear down on today. I want to talk to you about the skill of acceptance. Now, here's the thing. I think acceptance and rejection of people is just something that most of us do in life, and we don't even have a lot of awareness about how we're doing on it or the fact that we are or, or, or we're not doing it. See, most of us, here's how it goes. You have a list. In fact, you have two lists. So do I. And it's an invisible list of people that you've decided are acceptable or unacceptable. And, and, and you go about methodically, not consciously, but unconsciously, you go about determining in your life who winds up on the acceptable list and who winds up on the unacceptable list, depending on how they act or how they treat you or how they dress or where they live or what they say or what they do or what they believe. And people fall into your invisible list of acceptable or unacceptable, and, and depending on where they fall, that's how we treat them. Now, the list can be fluid. Sometimes people go back and forth. It just depends on the day or how they're doing or what they're doing or how they're acting towards you. But you and I, we, we all have a list, and it determines how we treat other people. And you may not even realize this, but the fact is, who you are, who I am today, we were all shaped, we were all changed, we all have become who we are 
based on the doses of acceptance or rejection that we receive in our lives up to this point. See, I believe all of our hearts and our lives and, our, and even our emotions, even the condition of our own souls, we get influenced and we get shaped by the ways in which we've been accepted and rejected all throughout our lives. See, God created human beings, and we're kind of like acceptance magnets. <laughs> in other words, our hearts, our bodies, we just nat naturally gravitate toward people and places where we feel unconditionally accepted. And, and see, this doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. We're all like this. It's, it's just something we all have. In fact, let me just say something to you. You might even find this kind of shocking, and you, you may even want to argue with me when I say it, but I'm going to say this anyway. You didn't choose your friends. And you're sitting there thinking, well, of course I did. I chose my friends. I didn't decide who I'm friends with. Actually, no, you didn't. You didn't choose your friends. You didn't make a conscious decision as to who your friends would be. I'll tell you what happened in your life. Naturally, you didn't plan this. You don't. It's just how you're made. You started naturally gravitating towards situations and places where you thought and mo most naturally would find people who would accept you. You hung out in these certain situations. You hung out in places where you most likely would find people that would offer you large amounts of acceptance. And then the people that you found in those places and situ situations, they naturally became your friends because they offered you acceptance. You went where you found acceptance, and that's how your friendships got started. See, you didn't walk down a street one day, point to a stranger, and say, ooh, I want you to be my friend. No. You became friends with the people who most often gave you unconditional acceptance. Did you know that acceptance is the reason why guys, some of you, <laughs> like to go to work more than you like to come home? It's true. It's all about acceptance. Because, see, here's how it happens for, for a lot of us guys. You, you start coming home in the evenings, and, and it hits you real hard one day, and you realize, wow, all of these people in my house, they have their own opinion about things, and they're not afraid to share it with me. Imagine that. <laughs> but it's different at work. See, at work, you, you got some influence. You, you kind of know what you're doing there, and, and you get to tell people what to do or how things get done. You, your opinion really, really matters there, and people people get paid by you or, or they're underneath the paycheck and so they decide they're going to do what you say and they agree with you all the time and you get a lot of praise and you get a lot of respect for the stuff that you do at work and you come home and it's not the same you start to feel more and more respected at work than you do at home and so what naturally happens and you don't mean for this to happen but it just happens in your heart you naturally get pulled it's like a gravitational pull you get pulled toward the places and the situations and the people who offer you the most acceptance do you know it's one of the reasons why married men and women fall in love with people who aren't their husband or wife? It's all about acceptance. See, affairs happen because someone begins to feel <clears throat> a little bit rejected at home by their spouse. And then this other person comes along and they start to make you feel more accepted or a little bit more attractive or a little more important than you were before. And it wasn't like you left home one day out of the blue and just said, I think I'm going to plan to cheat. I mean, nobody does that. It's a gravitational pull on your heart. You get pulled toward the places and the people where there are the most doses of acceptance being given to you. And sometimes those kind of things happen and you don't even realize it. Parents, <clears throat> did you realize that acceptance is the reason that your teenager listens to the advice that their friends give, you, give them more than they listen to your advice? Teenagers listen to the advice of their peers more than they listen to their parents' advice. It ain't ha it, it, listen, it has nothing to do with whether or not you're smarter than their friends, okay? Can we all just admit that? You are smarter than your kids' friends, okay? That's, that's a non-issue. <laughs> doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with acceptance. Your teenager doesn't choose their friend's advice because they give them smarter advice. They choose their friend's advice because they listen to acceptance more than they listen to lectures, they're just like you and they're just like me. They're acceptance magnets. Their hearts simply gravitate toward people and places where they feel as if they're receiving the most unconditional acceptance. Acceptance defines you. It defines me. It, it, it makes you who you are. In fact, some of you are sitting here today, and one of the reasons you're so banged up in your life, one of the reasons you, you've really suffered throughout your life, it, there's only one reason. You spent 
a large portion of your life trying to win the acceptance of someone and all they do is constantly reject you. And it's one of the most painful experiences you face in your life. It happens to you over and over and over again. You live with it daily. You're beating your head against a wall hoping that someone will accept you, that you really put a lot of stock in their acceptance. And it just doesn't happen. And you just get rejected. And you keep on trying. And it has defined who you are. It's defined your work, your self-worth. Acceptance and rejection, it affects the way you relate to God. It's true. See, I don't believe most people come to their understanding of who God is and how to relate to him based on like studying a book or even reading the Bible most often. Most often it comes from how God was portrayed to you growing up. See, if you came from a background where God was spoken of in terms of love and acceptance and grace and forgiveness, then that's affected how you approach God and how you relate to him today. But if you came from a background that God was all about making threats and God was all about judgment and not God was all about condemning you and that's affected how you relate to God even to this day. It shapes all of us. The amount of acceptance and rejection that you've received throughout your life, it shapes you. It shapes me in every single area. But like I said before, when you begin to follow Jesus, God, through his relationship with you, eventually asks you and me to accept other people and put this into practice regardless of what we've been taught in our past, regardless of what's been done to us in our other relationships, regardless of how we've been shaped by acceptance. And I want you to look at a passage of Scripture, and we're going to get some thoughts on this. It's from the book of Romans. This is a uh, book in the New Testament. It's chapter 15, we'll start with verse 5. We'll put it up on the screen for you. Watch what he says here. The writer says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the writer here says there, there's just this thing that ought to be present among people like those of us who follow Jesus. That there's just something that ought to be present among us who follow Christ. It's this thing he calls a spirit of unity. And what he means by that is he says there ought to be this attitude among followers of Christ that we're just on the same team because we follow the same God. We ought to just all have one goal. We ought to have one purpose. We ought to have one heart. And, and that's something I'm pretty sure you agree with. But then in the original language, when the writer writes this verse, he, he puts a word in between verses 6 and 7, and it kind of separates the two ideas. And it's a word kind of like therefore. In other words, what he's saying is, if there's going to be this spirit of unity that, that exists between followers of Christ, there's something that has to happen. If we're all going to be on the same team, there's just something that's going to help us get it done. He says, therefore, here's what will make that happen. Verse 7, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. And there it is. There's that people skill. He says, accept one another. And then, as if he knows we would probably want to argue, he says, let me qualify what kind of acceptance I'm talking about. And it's like, just in case you were wondering what this looks like and how far you ought to go, he clears it up in that next phrase. He says, here's the kind of acceptance that we're to offer to other people. He says, accept one another in the same way, in the same manner that you've received acceptance in your relationship with God. Now, if you want a picture of what acceptance looks like, I'll give it to you. It's kind of like catching a football. If you've ever seen someone trained to catch a football correctly, how do they do it? Well, the first thing you have to do to catch a football when it's thrown to you is you have to reach out your arms. You have to open your hands. And then you have to receive the ball with your hands. And then the last step is very important. You have to pull it in. You have to tuck it in so you can run, right? You have to reach out, receive, and then pull towards yourself draw that ball toward yourself that's what acceptance looks like see to accept someone you have to reach out towards them you have to receive them and you have to bring them close to yourself that's the habit that ought to characterize every single person who claims to follow Jesus Christ followers we are just people who are developing this habit of reaching out to people receiving those people and then drawing them to us now how far do we go to what extent 
Well, the text says it. We should accept in the same way, with the same intensity, to the same degree that Christ accepted us. Now, here's where this starts to get kind of tough. Because most of us, when we think about it, when we get real honest about it, we start to realize something. And this is what makes acceptance so hard. We realize that, hey, when God accepted me, the moment God accepted me, I was pretty unacceptable at the time. (laughs) When God chose me to be in a relationship with me, I didn't have my act all together. I I didn't live up to God's expectations. But in spite of that, God still reached out his hand. He received me. And he drew me into a relationship with him. And once he did that, that was when I started to change. That was what made me different. Not before, but after. And the Bible says that I'm supposed to accept people in my life the exact same way and with the same intensity and the same degree that God did for me. So what that means is I must become someone who goes in, who, who gets into the habit of accepting people before they change, before they become acceptable. And see, let's be honest. That's not how you operate, is it? It's not how we operate. It's just not, it's not how we do things. See, that's, that's not how most of us were treated growing up. That, that's not how some of you were treated, even in your own family growing up. Doesn't matter. That's the standard if you're a follower of Jesus. It flows out of what God did for us. And I love that final phrase. If you didn't, we didn't read it the first time. I want to highlight that final phrase in that verse. He says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Why? In order to bring praise to God. He says, when we learn to accept people the way Christ has accepted us, he says it brings praise to God. Want to know why that is? Well, think about it this way when do you give high praise to another person when 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 do you give extra credit to somebody do you you give somebody praise or extra credit when they just go right up to the to the level of expectation and just meet the expectations of course not i mean it's that'd be like saying hey way to go honey you did the precise amount of homework you were supposed to do good job or hey way to go you got a 70 you didn't fail i mean People don't do that. Praise comes not in response to ordinary things. Praise, people get recognized. People get praised when they, when they do something that goes above and beyond, past the norm, something that's a big, big deal. And so what the writer is trying to tell us here in this verse is saying, look, it was a big deal when God, in his mercy, accepted you before you became acceptable. And it's a really big deal when Christ's followers accept other people who hurt them, who disappoint them. Because, see, nobody does that, do they? It's not normal. It's not the way the culture tells us we ought to behave. It's not, it's not intuitive. It doesn't come naturally. And I'll tell you what is intuitive. I'll tell you what does come naturally. It's when you say, hey, look, as soon as you get your act together, as soon as you come around... <laughs> Maybe, just maybe, if you change your ways or you change your mind, maybe I'll consider letting you back into my relational world. But not until then. And then God says, hey, look, you know, I I got some big-time praise when I sent my son into the world, and he died for unacceptable people. So now I'm asking you, will you do the same thing for others that I did for you? See, this is, and I get this, this is, this is where it gets really, really sticky. <laughs> because in order for this whole thing, for you and me to live this out, to, for it to become a lifestyle, it often means that something in me and something in you has got to die first. And, and it starts out like this. It, it means that I have to give up my right to be right. I have to give up my, my need to, to try and, make a point because when somebody does me wrong or when they're not living right or they don't do what I train them to do they don't live how I raise them to live it's like I want to make a point 
Don't you? It's like I want to convince them first of of how wrong they are. I want to show them where they're wrong. I want to show them how I'm right. And God comes along and says, no, 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 no. I didn't call you to make a point. I I, I called you to build a bridge. But God, you see, I... I'm, I'm right, they're wrong, I want to win the argument. God says, I didn't call you to win arguments. I'm asking you to win a heart. See, this is what we often forget. When you weren't living up to expectations, <laughs> when I wasn't living up to expectations, God didn't argue with me. He just accepted me. See, see when, when you were wrong, God didn't try to win the argument with you. God started out first winning your heart. God wasn't trying to make his point. He started out by building a bridge. And let me put it this way, and before I even say this, this is going to sound wrong to you, for most of you, especially if you're a Christian. (laughs) So let me just say, before I say it, give me some grace, and and I'll explain what I mean by this. Let let me put it in context before before you make judgment calls on this. Jesus didn't come into this world to be right Jesus didn't come into this world just to be right that wasn't his goal if that were the only reason Jesus came into this earth trust me he could have got that done (laughs) I mean he could have just spent three years walking around telling everybody how wrong they were and Jesus could have done it because he was God in the flesh he knew the thoughts and the motives and he knew everybody's heart Jesus could have walked around for three years and said, okay, you're wrong, and you're wrong, and, well, you're wronger than she is, and, boy, are you wrong, and that's a wrong motive, and that's a wrong thought, and wrong, 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 and now all y'all come follow me. And nobody would have ever followed him. Because, see, Jesus rarely ever did that. Now, did he spend time pointing out things that were wrong? Yes, he did but only when it was absolutely necessary. But if you go back and you'll look at the three and a half years that Jesus spent in his ministry, you will notice, what did he spend most of his time doing? Jesus spent most of his time walking among wrong people. He hung out with sinners, and he wasn't trying to convince them all the time. He was just building bridges. He didn't go around trying to win all the arguments. He went around trying to win their hearts and their affections. He started by accepting unacceptable people. And now Jesus says to us, his followers, I've left my life as an example to you. I want you to do what I have done for you. I'm asking you, just like I did among you, now you do the same for the people in your life. I'm not calling you to try and convince everybody of how wrong they are and how right you are. I'm calling you to accept them. I'm not sending you out to win arguments. I'm sending you out to win hearts. And look, I know this is hard. This is not going to be easy. And I know they don't deserve it. I know you're right. You're right, okay? You're right. But I didn't call you to be right. Because one day, at one point, you were wrong too. It's not about that. You accept them the way I've accepted you. And here's the amazing thing that happens. When, when you start to view relationships and the people in your life through this lens, it has the power to change those relationships. It has the power to bring about change in your relationships the same way that God's relationship with you has brought about change in you. Because, see, here, here's... Here's what I always want, and this, I bet this is true of you too. I want to do both, right? It, it's like, I want to I wanna like win the argument because I, I'm right and they're wrong. I want to win the argument, and I also want to win their heart. I, I, I want to win their affection. I want a relationship too. I want both. And so what we often do is we go about starting with winning the argument, hoping that we'll get the relationship on the back end, And it never works. But here's the truth. You can have both. You can have both. Because of the way Jesus has shown us that it works. Because this is the way our Heavenly Father did it for us. But here's the key. Stop focusing on winning the argument. Stop 
focusing on making your point. Stop focusing on just being right. That's the part of you and in me that just has to die. Give that up. And take all of that energy and focus all of that energy on winning a heart. Focus all of that energy on, 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 on accepting all of that energy you have of wanting to be right and wanting to win the argument. Take all of that energy and make acceptance your focal point. Put acceptance first, and you have a, sh a chance, you have a shot at getting both. Because when you do, here's what happens. You retain something. You, you retain influence. You have the potential to be an influence in a person's life. You, because you start with a real loving relationship with this person. And because you start with relationship, you wind up retaining respect. You retain affection. And then, maybe, by God's grace, you'll be able to change the heart of this person that you are convinced needs to change. But it'll never happen if you're only focused and concerned about winning and, and being right. Acceptance must come first. And we know this is true because it's how God chose to relate to you and me. So, how, how do we do this? How, how, do I, how do I put this into practice? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about taking a next step on this. Around here, every Sunday, we, we try to take a next step. We try to do something in our lives that will lead us to put into practice what we've learned and so if you want to take out your connection card right now I encourage you with all our campuses take out your card and look on the back of it and you'll find some next steps right here on the left hand side and, and I just want to call your attention to the very first one it says look this week I'm going to do one thing to communicate acceptance to someone in my life that's just hard for me to accept listen maybe you're here and, and you're a parent and you've been watching your kid make some horrible choices I get that and you know they're just wrong or, or maybe you've got a rift between you and, and, and someone at your work because they really have done something terrible to you or maybe your parent your mom your dad hasn't done anything worthy of your acceptance ever or in years they've been unfair they've been unreasonable maybe you're a husband or a wife and if you're honest most of the time your spouse just doesn't do anything worthy of your acceptance. Maybe you've got a brother or a sister, and, and they're making some really stupid choices. Their life is way off track. Can I just challenge you to think about one thing you could do this week, one thing in the next seven days that would just communicate one truth to this person. I accept you. My arms, my heart, I'm open to you. I... I and see, this doesn't mean that I'm happy with what they've done. It doesn't mean that I'm condoning what they've said or what they did. Not, that's not what this is. It's saying, even though I disagree with the choices you've made or the way you've done or what you haven't done, as far as a relationship, I'm open. I'm open to you. I accept you. There is still room in my heart, and there is still room in my world for you. What could you do this week that would communicate that to the person that you're struggling to accept? I'm telling you, this acceptance thing, I know it's messy, and I know it's sometimes hard for you to watch a loved one walk down a path, and you know it's wrong. I get all of that, but I am telling you, you really do have a choice in this. Would you rather win the argument? Would you rather be right? Or would you rather win their heart? Would you rather be right, or would you like a relationship? God has already done this for you. All he's asking is, will you do it for someone else? You take that step this week, and you try to do one thing, and let us know that on your connection card. Here's what will happen. Not anything weird. We're not going to contact you. We're just going to pray for you. We pray for every person who takes the next step at our church because we want to be behind you in this. Maybe your next step, you say, I can't. I, I'm not there yet. I need a heart change on this, and that, that is totally understandable. Maybe your next step is what the next step says on the card. Maybe it's time for you to start praying. God, would you change my heart? Would you, would you change me, open me up to be able to accept people the way you've accepted me? Because right now, God, I'm not sure I'm there. I believe God will honor that prayer. And we'll come right along behind you and we'll pray with you as well. You, you just go ahead and take that step. And listen, let me just say this as just sort of a last thing. I know that with, when I talk about this kind of a, a, of a thing, there's a lot of you with a lot of stories. And, and you've got some situations that 
many of us couldn't even imagine. There's a lot of nuance involved in this. There's special circumstances. And, and the truth is you need to be real careful about how you approach people because you've got to think about this because for some of you, some of your relationships have potential danger attached to them. There's been trauma done to you, things that have been really traumatic in your past. And, and this kind of thing is challenging and it's very, very fragile. And I just want you to know, I don't, I don't, I don't discount any of that. I'm totally sensitive to that whole situation. And maybe you're at a place where you're right now, you're like, I'm not sure what to do about this. I, maybe you need some counsel on this. Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you could bring this up in your small group this week as you're discussing this topic. Maybe talk to your small group leader. Maybe talk to your campus pastor before you leave today or someone on our staff. We want to help you navigate because I know some of these situations, they're really in complicated, and we get that. Maybe you need to talk to somebody before you leave today or maybe this week. I pray you'll do that. Right now, let's, let's bow at all of our campuses, and I'll pray for us. God, I ask that you would right now just overwhelm us with this truth that you've reminded us of today, that before we were acceptable, before we had it all figured out, before we were, 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 were right, when we were in the wrong, you opened up your arms, you reached out for us, and you drew us to relationship with yourself. And God, through that acceptance that you gave us unconditionally, we were changed. And now, God, for those of us who follow you, we know what that's like. God, would you help us to do the same for the people in our lives? God, this is not always easy. But God, it is what you ask of us. And God, you've never asked us to do what you haven't already done for us. So. God, thank you for your example through your son, the way he accepted us and the way he loves us. God, give us that same acceptance and love for the people you've placed in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.